All right, happy Sunday, Bridgepoint Church. How's everybody doing? You feeling okay? There we go, man. I'm really glad you're here today. We're going to wrap up our series called Know God's Will. And uh, I'm believing for, I hope you'll lean in with me, for an encounter with the Almighty God that we're discovering. The principle, the precipice of this series has been the idea that God has a plan, a purpose, his, his will for you. And you and I can know it, that he doesn't intend to be a distant God, a far off God, a God that wants to make you guess for it. But instead, like the prophet Isaiah said, this is kind of the, the theme verse for this series that whether you go to the right or the left, there'll be a voice behind you that says, this is the way walk in it, that God would be that near and that close and that personal to you along the way. We've gotten such positive feedback, better than usual for this series. So uh, you maybe you need to head to the YouTube channel and catch up the Bridgepoint app. Uh, but let's be present in this moment as we begin to wrap it up. I have one more final thought that I want to share with you about what it looks like to be able to know God's will. And so towards that end, we're going to jump straight in uh, to an Old Testament passage where you really get to see what we've been talking about and learning and discovering sort of put into action uh, through this passage. So I'm pretty excited about it. We're going to be in the book of Joshua. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Otherwise, I'll put it on the screen or grab your Bible app, whatever you need to follow along. Let me paint a little bit of picture of what's going on. Essentially, God chose a people. They were the Hebrew people, the Israelites, and God chose them to bless them in order that they might be a blessing for the nations, that he wanted to bless some that would bless others, pointing back to his goodness. The problem was those people were a lot like us, awfully fickle, awfully desiring to do their own thing rather than God's thing, wanting to rebel against him and his goodness, missing out on his plans and purposes. Well, eventually they were caught up into slavery. They were held captive by the Egyptian people. God saw them in their time of need. He sent Moses to deliver them. Moses was the leader of the Israelite people, and Moses was the one that freed them from slavery. Maybe you've heard the story where they were pinned against the Red Sea with Pharaoh's army coming. God split the sea and the Israelites walked across on dry ground and he rescued them out of slavery and, and set them free. He promised, God promised the Israelite people that, that he would set them free to the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey, which maybe for some of you sounds pretty mid, but back in that time, that was super exciting. They were living for the land of milk and honey. However, because of their own disobedience, because of their own rebellion, they had to spend some time wandering in the desert, a full generation, 40 years, missing out on the promised land because of their own hearts, their hearts bending, being bent towards rebellion. So even, even Moses didn't get to lead them into the promised land. Joshua would do that. That's where we find our story. That's where we're picking it up today. Joshua has just been announced as the new leader. Moses has passed away. Joshua's in charge of the people. Joshua's gonna be the one that leads the nation of Israel into the promised land that God had promised for them. Uh, it's an exciting story. It's not the, 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 uh, the entering of the promised land that's even the point of today's message, though. Joshua does something super strange, to be honest, but I think his heart behind that is actually something that you and I don't do enough of. So that's where we're headed today. I wanna jump straight in. The book of Joshua chapter three, as this historical account is recorded, I wanna jump in in verse seven. I'm gonna have to jump around quite a bit today for the sake of time. I know you all have lunch plans and you'd rather get to those than hear me anyway. Be honest, you know it, all right? We're gonna start in verse seven. We're gonna jump through it. You might wanna go home and read all of chapter three and chapter four after today's message for the full context. But here's where we begin today. The Lord said to Joshua, today I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. And pausing here for just a second, God was saying to Joshua, Joshua, you're the new leader and today all the people are gonna see that my hand is upon you as you lead the people that my hand is upon, the nation of Israel. I'm instantly reminded that when it comes to knowing God's will, and we're even seeing it in this verse, in order to know God's will, we have to understand the big idea from week one of this series, that God's will for your life, present day, Real moment, God's will for your life will be linked to his will for the world. That's just gonna be true for us. We can't have a plan, a purpose from God that doesn't line up with his purposes that he's executing all around the world. And that's what he's saying to Joshua. Joshua, your job is to lead these people whom I will bless to be a blessing. They were all, it was linked together. His blessing for the world, his heart for the world, it's rooted in love. Love was the motivating factor then, 
Love will be the motivating factor to understand God's will for your life present day right here, right now. The story continues. Verse nine says this, and Joshua said to the people of Israel, come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. So God literally just says to Joshua, Joshua, today's gonna be the moment that they're all gonna know that I have placed you in charge. So the first thing Joshua does is he rallies everybody in. He says, okay, everybody gather around before we do anything, hear the word of God. Reminds me of the big idea of week two of this series. Our lives will align with God's plans when God's word, we call it the Bible, the, becomes the blueprint for the life we are building. Joshua's context was before the Bible as we currently know it, but what he was saying is, guys, understand before we go anywhere today or any other day, we're gonna be listening and obedient to what God speaks to us as a nation. And I wonder how many of us are working to build a life that's built opposite on a foundation of having God at the heart of who we are and what he's calling us into. So God was calling the nation of Israel into the promised land, one problem, and it wasn't a small one. In order to get into the promised land, the nation of Israel had to cross the Jordan River. The promised land was on the other side of the Jordan River, and this wasn't like a minor thing. It's not like they just jumped onto their inflatable raft. They'd spend time blowing up the raft and grab a paddle and head across. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of people that needed to cross a Jordan River that we're about to find out was at peak season. It was overflowing its banks already. So not only was it normally dangerous, it was extra dangerous right now because of the time of year it was. We're talking about God saying, the promised land is yours, I'm gonna lead you into it. One problem, one wrong step, one careless decision, one unthoughtful movement could move you from experiencing the promised land to utter disaster, possibly losing your life. This was a big, big deal for these hundreds of thousands of people that could literally see what God had promised them, but were facing some really different circumstances, some really difficult circumstances. As we head into that today, I wonder if there's anybody present or tuning in that you're in the exact same place that you feel like you know what God wants to do in your life. You feel like maybe God's calling you into something, but the, the space between realizing that fully and where you are looks awfully threatening, looks awfully scary, awfully confusing. That it's one of those moments that, again, this would be really easy. Like, I can almost see it. I can almost taste it. I, God, I, I just feel so strongly that you're pointing me in this direction. But God, what about this river? What about this scary circumstance, this stress-inducing, anxiety-causing thing, whatever the thing is. is. Is it a relationship? Is it a financial thing? Is it a work thing? We're out of school. It can't be a school thing anymore. God, well, I, I, I can almost see it, but, but this river, God, and you may be exactly the person that needs to lean in and be fully present right here. Because based on how the first service went and the reports of how services are going at all of our campuses, this might be your moment to have an encounter with God that gives you the confidence that changes everything. Because here's what happens next for the Israelite people. Jumping down to verse 15 of chapter three says this. Joshua was giving them the plan and he said, as soon as those bearing the ark, the ark was the covenant, it was the 10 commandments, it was the physical representation of God's presence with the people. As soon as those bearing the ark had come as far as the Jordan River and the feet of the priests bearing the ark were dipped in the brink of the water, side note, now the Jordan overflows all its banks throughout the time of harvest. So they're coming right up to the river. Joshua has just given them the plan. As soon as there's the, the feet of the priests dip into the water, here's what's gonna happen, Joshua said. The water's coming down from above. We know rivers flow from high altitude to low. The water's coming down from above, stood and rose up in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zarathan. And those flowing down towards the Sea of Arabah, the Salt Sea, were completely cut off. The people passed over opposite of Jericho. Don't miss this, track with me, it's gonna make sense. Here's what Joshua is saying. Now, the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firmly on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan. 
Now, I want to pause for just a minute because oftentimes when we're reading the Bible, we read over these historical accounts and we don't give them enough wow factor that they deserve. God was literally going to cause this river to stop its flow and build up like it's a, a wall upstream so that the nation of Israel would stand on dry ground in a river. The power of God at work. One woo is all we got today. You all need more coffee. Let me try it again. I'm expecting more. I need your help. Okay, don't leave me out to dry. The nation of Israel would stand on dry ground in the midst of a river because of the power of God. First service did the exact same thing. So it it could be me, not you. (laughs) But I'm gonna blame you because I have the mic. I wonder how often many of us don't experience the woo moments of belief in God simply because we don't often see mighty works of God like that. That we think, yeah, it sounds really good. It's written in the Bible. I'll believe it because it's in the Bible. But in my life, like, I just don't see God working like that. I don't see God doing stuff like that. Can I remind you just really quickly of a couple things that you and I have been learning as a part of this series, but the Israelites, they were gonna experience this firsthand in this historical account. Number one was our, our big idea that said this, God's will for your life will be discovered more in giving than in your receiving. Because God didn't make you to just con- continually absorb or consume. He actually made you with a purpose that would impact other people. And in order for the Israelites to experience a mighty move of God, they had to be willing to say, God, where you lead, what you call us to, we will follow. We will go. It had to be about something bigger than them. And the mighty move of God didn't get set into motion until they became intentional about looking beyond what felt good, felt right, or benefited them. It reminds me of another big idea from the series that God's will for your life is on the other side of putting your faith into action. That, that I gave us the caution that we're not gonna Netflix binge our way into purpose. It doesn't work that way. But instead to believe that God was at work and doing something and to respond to it, those are the moments where we see the might of God come into play. Again, the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firmly on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan. And all Israel was passing over on dry ground until the nation finished passing over the Jordan. But did you notice when God stopped the water from flowing? It was the moment they began to step into the water that was flowing. It was the moment that they put their faith into action of saying, okay, God, that's where you're calling me. This is the separator. This is scary. This is life-threatening. This riddles me with anxiety. But God, if you're calling us to go, then one step at a time. When was the moment that they fully understand it? Because I'm sure that first step, it didn't all wall up immediately because a wall had to happen and then the, the flow that was already in motion would have happened, right? First step in, did they see that the water began to lessen? Maybe not. Was it the second step? Was it the third step that they said, whoa, something incredible is beginning to happen? Was it the fourth step that it began to dip below their ankle and a little further down their feet? Was it the fifth step that they thought, wait, is this water literally going away? Was it the sixth step that they were like, well, I think something magical, something powerful, something that's only possible by a move of God. Was it the seventh step that they had to put their foot in the, into where the water should be flowing that they stepped back and said, Only an almighty God that is sovereign or in control over all creation could do something like that. But it wasn't until they took a step. I wonder how many of us right now, present day in this moment, are right on the banks of experiencing a mighty work, a mighty move of God in that relationship, that financial struggle, that work thing, that family thing, that friend thing, that that thing that keeps you up at night. I wonder how many of us are right on the banks of it with all of heaven saying, yes, this is it. You're about to see something radical. But we never take the step. We never begin to step into seeing a move of God that defies the natural order of creation because that's who our God is. I'm reminded of the Israelites in this moment encountering a big idea that we had in in our series that was God's will is experienced in steps 
of obedience. Each step for them deeper into a river that would have killed them was a step that allowed them to more fully experience God's will at work in their life and God's power that would help them accomplish it. Are we stepping into what God is asking us to do? Because can I be totally transparent? If we're taking steps away from what God's calling us into, God's not gonna bless the very thing that's leading us away from him. And I wonder if we're missing the move of God because of that. I wonder how many steps into dry ground where a river flows. I wonder how many steps until they got to the center before the nation of Israel's turning around like, guys, this is unbelievable. Come experience what God is doing. Come see this. Come stand on this dry ground. This is the part where we would normally be sucked under and we can dance on it, man. We can dance in light of what God is doing. Let's go to the other side. The promised land is ours. It reminds me of Gabe's message last week and his big idea that God's will is made more clear through our praise. And you better believe that each step they took across, that it had to be pulling, calling out praise of God because of his might and his goodness and his faithfulness. And the fact that yet again, God didn't leave his, leave his people on the side of that which was threatening to destroy them, but instead was committed to seeing them experience all that he had promised. Can I ask you something? Have you had an encounter with God like that? Has there been a moment in your faith journey that you just said, I, I can't but praise God for this. I can't believe this. I, I know they happen because so many times, so many of you come to me well, after a message and say, man, I, I needed to hear that. You understand that that's God personalizing his words just for you? Have you had an encounter where you just, you trusted God maybe for the very first time and it's almost like you can feel the weight of life, the burden of sin lift off of you? You remember that moment? Remember the moment that you shared it with somebody and for the first time they said, man, maybe I need to get to know God a little bit better. Do you remember how that just fires you up? You remember the moment where you read the words of God and something jumps out to you like, God, are you like literally speaking to me? I don't even have to hear your words. I can read them and know that that was for me. I know, I know for some of you, you're, you're coming to Bridgepoint because it's a safe place to come with doubts. And some of you are here online or in the room with more questions than you have confidence. You're kicking the tires of faith because you're not sure if this is real, if there even is a God or if there is, if he's knowable. And then he would care to even know someone like you. And I want you to know I get it. And I want to pause right here in the middle of Joshua's story to say maybe, maybe this message isn't going to be as much for you as it will be people that have been following for a while. But if that's you and you're uncertain about faith, you're, you're asking questions, you're coming with just what feels like a mountain of doubts, what I would love for you just to spend time processing today is this, that 2,000 years ago, that almighty God, the creator of everything, became his creation. He came as a baby, a man, Jesus. He came to be God with us, God that understood us, God that knew our pains and our hurts, God that would see the anxiety and the effects of sin and brokenness, God that would become sin for us, a God that would die where we should die because of our sin and rebellion against the holiness of God and a God that they would place in a tomb but a God that was more powerful than sin and more powerful than the grave and a God that three days later would rise from the grave to offer us new life and a new purpose that nothing in this world could ever define or shape for us. Maybe that's the place that some of you need to start because if that story is true and as a pastor, I absolutely believe that it is and I absolutely know many of us in the room online engaging with Bridgepoint that have encountered the truth of that story and been changed from the inside out with the power of God at work in your life. But in order to be confident in his continued work today, I want you to look back to that historical event 2,000 years ago and ask yourself, what if that changed everything for me? There's gonna be an opportunity to go to prayer and care after these services, but I know for some of you, that may, mean, may need to be the space that you start. I just want you to hang on to that as we move forward because I haven't even got to the part that Joshua did that was super weird. 
that I want us to spend time focusing on today. So back to Joshua, all right? Let me jump into um, the, the rest of kind of that story. Joshua chapter four, we're gonna start in verse one. The nation of Israel is walking across a river on dry ground because almighty God stepped in and has defied the very laws of nature that he created to show up on behalf of his people and his people to discover his will. Here's how the story continued. When all the nation had finished passing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, take 12 men from the people, from each tribe, a man. There were 12 tribes that made up the nation of Israel. And he said, grab one guy from every tribe. I want them to do something. Command them saying, take 12 stones from here out of the midst of the Jordan, from the very place where the priest's feet stood firmly and bring them over with you and lay them down in the place where you lodge tonight. Then Joshua called the 12 men from the people of Israel, whom he had appointed, a man from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, pass on before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, into the midst of the dry ground of this river, and take up each of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of tribes of the people of Israel, 12 stones. And I'm not talking about little river pebbles. I'm talking about Joshua said, go grab a massive stone, like shoulder it out of the water. At which point I feel very confident that everybody would have been like, Joshua, the part about crossing the river on dry ground is really, really cool. But now that you're focused on landscape decoration, I have questions. <laughs> Why are we worried about river rocks in the midst of a mighty miracle of God? It seems like the least important concern for you to think about how you wanna decorate your house when we get into the promised land. But I think God knew something about the people of Israel and I'm betting God knows it about you too. And I want you to track with me and see exactly what God's doing. Because Joshua said, grab one of the giant rocks from where the water flows. Grab one of those things that otherwise we would have no shot at ever picking up on our own. Because we can't swim out there and we can't pull out something like that without being pulled under ourselves. And Joshua's saying, all 12 of you to represent the massive nature of this group of people that experienced the massive, mighty move of God, throw one of those massive things up on your shoulders and get it over to the other side. Because Joshua knew something that God had told them about humanity, about the nature of people that really, really mattered. What, what was Joshua up to? What was God up to? Some of you may know this story. Some of you don't. I want you to see it. I'm gonna jump down to verse 15 and, and here's how it went. The Lord said to Joshua, command the priests bearing the ark of the testimony to come up out of the Jordan. So Joshua commanded the priests, come up out of the Jordan. And when the priests bearing the ark of the covenant of the Lord came up from the midst of the Jordan, the place where the river usually flows, and the soles of the priest's feet were lifted up on dry ground, the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and overflowed all its banks as before. They grabbed these massive stones, hundreds of thousands of people crossed over, and the moment they put their feet, both feet planted on the edge where dry ground normally is, is the moment that that water came thundering back through, flowing just as it always does. The miracle was complete. The faithfulness of God seen firsthand and the will of God and those people executed in a way that those people never could have experienced it. Two verses ahead, jump with me. Here was the point of it. And those 12 stones, which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal. And he said to the people of Israel, when your children ask their fathers in times to come, what do these stones mean? then you shall let your children know Israel passed over this Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up for us until we passed over. And the point of remembering is so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty and that you may fear the Lord your God forever." That's not fear in terms of being terrified of him. It's fear him in terms of having such a healthy, holy respect of his holiness that it prompts you to say, God, I wanna be yours and experience you to the fullest. Joshua commanded the people to do what God had spoken to them. And I think what God uniquely knows about you and me, just like he did the Israelite people, is how fickle our hearts can tend to be. And he said, 
I want to do something that speaks right into their doubts, speaks right into the anxiety, and speaks right into the moments that they're going to struggle to believe. Grab the rig of rocks, form them in such a way that it makes something that causes people to ask, how did this giant stack of boulders happen? So that every single one of us may never forget the mighty work of God. So that people coming from out of town says, what is, what's this random rock statue about? And we get to say, let me tell you about the goodness of my God. So that in the moments when some of our friends and some of our family are seeing the rush of a river that creates more terror and anxiety or confusion, in the moments where we feel doubtful or concerned when we can't see clearly what's ahead, in the moment the relationship seems too broken or the finances are too incomplete and in a disastrous form, in the moment when the work stuff is falling apart, when the school stuff is incomplete, in the moment when it feels like life is caving in, we want that that pile of rocks to force us to look back and say, oh, but my God, though the river was flowing and terrifying, though we've been in the midst of some crazy storms, though it seemed impossible, though it was so scary, though we saw no way out, our God was bigger and stronger than the river, more in control of the storm, and more possible in the impossible than we ever could have dreamed. And our God is good and with us. So let us never miss the moment to remember and brag on the might of our God, and he's worth following forever. The power of God at work. So listen, let me give you one thought as I begin to wrap it up today. And to know God's will, I wanna give you this one thing to consider. You gain confidence to walk in God's will when you remember God's faithfulness in the past. Because listen, storms of life will still come terrifying rivers or fill in the blank of what it is in your circumstances will still be part of your journey. We're still walking by faith and faith is taking steps even when our faith isn't by sight yet. And we, give, we get confidence, we gain confidence to walk in God's will when we remember how good he's been in the past, how faithful he was, how he showed up when we saw no way, no way and we can trust him to do it again. I think God understood something about us that we don't give ourselves enough credit about. We often forget how good he is. We often forget how faithful he is. We often let the storm rage and drown out the memories of his goodness and the ways that he's come through in the past. We often get caught up in the present moment and forget how present God is in those moments too. And I think Joshua understood something that if we're gonna experience God's will to the fullest, we must force ourselves to remember so let me wrap up in a very practical way. And I think if you and I will commit to practicing some of these things, it might benefit us into stepping into God's will. Here's what it looks like to remember God's faithfulness. Four easy things, and then I'm done. Number one, journal the things of God. Journal the things of God. When those of you come and say, man, I feel like you were speaking exactly to me. I hope you're writing that down. If God's speaking to you, if God's speaking to me, I hope we write those moments down so that we don't forget them. I know what a lot of you do is you, you point your phone at me and take a picture. And I don't think it's because of me that you want in the picture. I hope what you're doing is trying to memorialize something of saying, man, I see God at work in that. I see God's goodness in that. And when I never see my wife taking pictures of me, I'm pretty sure you want the words on the screen and not just me. Get that, hold on to those, capture that. It's God's voice spoken to you through God's word and other people around. Journal those things, write them down. How quickly we forget. Second thing, tell people what God has done. We call that a, a testimony. And I, I feel like for some of us, we make this way too hard. 
I, I think when I say tell people what God has done, I'm not saying, okay, I'm gonna invite this friend. Are you available on this date at this time? I'm gonna bring my computer. I have a great PowerPoint presentation with some keynote notes and everything, a full presentation. I wanna tell you about the things of God and your friend's gonna be like, I'm busy that day and every other day that you wanna do something like that. But you know what we don't do? We don't ever just say, man, I was in the middle of it, but here's how I experienced God and it changed everything. Or to hear a friend that's saying, man, I'm hurting right now and I don't want to do, to be able to say, I don't have all the answers, but when I was in something similar, here's how I experienced God and it mattered to me. I've been a new parent. I've been to, I've been to a new job. I've been in that circumstance. I've, I've felt that strain. I've felt that anxiety. I've seen the rush of that river. And let me tell you how God came through for me. And I bet if you'll pursue him, he'd come through for you too. Give a testimony. Tell somebody what God's done. It's the good stuff. Maybe you need to do exactly like Joshua commanded the people back then too, but gather something tangible. When I graduated from high school, my youth pastor, just like, uh, just like Joshua did, he, he gave me a rock. He wrote some words on it. And that rock, it sits on my dresser to this day. And every time I see that rock, you know what it forces me to do? It makes me remember God's faithfulness of that time and what my youth pastor was praying over for me as I stepped into a new season of my life. Maybe it's a seashell. Maybe you need to grab a picture of that sunset next time you experience it. Maybe you need to take a picture of how beautiful that flower smells and how much it reminds you of God's goodness expressed through nature. Maybe it's writing down or, or grabbing a selfie with a good friend whose conversation stirred something in you. Take, do something tangible, legal, but tangible. <laughs> Don't come at me saying, Pastor, I need you to bail me out. I did what you said. Gather something tangible to remember the presence and work of God in that moment. One last thing. Remember God's faithfulness by taking communion. That's why we do that. We don't do it every Sunday at Bridgepoint because we never want it to become so routine that it loses, us, loses its power to help us remember. So we're gonna do that together today because you know what that represents? That represents the depth of love that God has for you and me. That in our brokenness, in our sin, in our doubts, with our anxieties and our confusion and the moments that we felt hopeless and uncertain and unclear, those were the moments that we take communion to remind ourselves that God stepped into our brokenness, not for the full weight of judgment and condemnation, but instead for freedom for hope, that we might know grace and, and have a taste of mercy, and that his mercy might be new every single morning, that it represents his life given where ours should have been, and it represents his rising that offers us new life, new hope, and new purpose. We take communion so we can remember his goodness, and when we remember his goodness, I hope that what it does is spur you to say, God, I'm going to trust you today because of how faithful and good you were yesterday. And I'll believe for it again tomorrow too. So as we enter into this moment, would you allow me to pray with you? Let's pray together. God, I wanna ask for a couple moments that you'll carve out every distraction, everything that's waiting for us in a long weekend or at work or with friends or whatever else. God, would you allow us to just be here right now, right in this space? God, we wanna stop everything and remember. And God, from that remembrance, I'm gonna ask that you well us up with courage to begin to step into your will in ways that we have never experienced or encountered before. And God, that we're gonna ask that that courage comes through remembering. Your sacrifice is enough. Our identity as sons and daughters is secure. It's all true and it's all real and it all matters. So God, we want to remember, would you be present, Father, in this place? Would your spirit be at work in this space that it gives us confidence to trust you today and tomorrow and every day after? We pray it in the mighty name of Jesus and everybody said,